next part of Little House in the Big Woods. When we left off, they were still in the store. All right, Ma chose two patterns of calico to make shirts for Pa and a piece of brown denim to make him a jumper. Then she got some white cloth to make sheets and underwear. Pa got enough calico to make Ma a new apron. Ma said, oh no, Charles, I don't really need it. But Pa laughed and said she must pick it out or he would get her the turkey red piece with the big yellow pattern. Ma smiled and flushed pink and she picked out a pattern of rosebuds and leaves on a soft fawn colored ground. Then Pa got for himself a pair of galluses and some tobacco to smoke in his pipe. And Ma got a pound of tea and a little paper package of store sugar to have in the house when company came. It was a pale brown sugar, not dark brown like the maple sugar Ma used for every day. When all the trading was done, the storekeeper gave Mary and Laura each a piece of candy. They were so astonished and so pleased that they just stood there looking at their candies. Then Mary remembered and said, thank you. Laura could not speak. Everybody was waiting and she could not make a sound. Ma had to ask her, what do you say, Laura? Then Laura opened her mouth and gulped and whispered, thank you. After they went out of the store, both pieces of candy, after that they went out of the store. Both pieces of candy were white and flat and thin and heart-shaped. There was printing on them in red letters. Ma read it for them. Mary's said, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Laura's said only, sweets to the sweet. The pieces of candy were exactly the same size. Laura's printing was larger than Mary's. They all went back through the sand to the wagon on the lake shore. Pa fed the horses. On the bottom of the wagon box, some oats he had brought them for their dinner. Ma opened the picnic box. They all sat on the warm sand near the wagon and ate bread and butter and cheese, hard boiled eggs and cookies. The waves of Lake Pepin curled up on the shore at their feet and slid back with the smallest hissing sound. After dinner, Pa went back to the store to talk a while with other men. Ma sat holding Carrie quietly until she went to sleep, but Laura and Mary ran along the lakeshore picking up pretty pebbles that had been rolled back and forth by the waves until they were polished smooth. There were no pebbles like that in the big woods. When she found a pretty one, Laura put it in her pocket, and there were so many, each prettier than the last, that she filled her pocket full. Then Pa called and they ran back to the wagon, for the horses were hitched up and it was time to go. Laura was so happy when she ran through the sand to Pa with all those beautiful pebbles in her pocket. But when Pa picked her up and tossed her into the wagon, a dreadful thing happened. The heavy pebbles tore her pocket right out of her dress. The pocket fell and the pebbles rolled all over the bottom of the wagon box. Laura cried because she had torn her best dress. Okay, look. There's Laura crying. There's Pa. And see, there's the tear. And that's where her pocket fell out and there's the pebbles. Oh. Ma gave Carrie to Pa and came quickly to look at the torn place. Then she said it was all right. Stop crying, Laura, she said, I can fix it. She showed Laura that the dress was not torn at all, nor the pocket. The pocket was a little bag sewn into the seam of the dress and hanging under it. Only the seams had ripped. Ma could sew the pocket in again, as good as new. Pick up the pretty pebbles, Laura, Ma said, and another, and another time, don't be so greedy. So Laura gathered up the pebbles, put them in the pocket, and carried the pocket in her lap. She did not mind very much when Pa laughed at her for being such a greedy little girl that she took more than she could carry away. Nothing like that ever happened to Mary. Mary was a good little girl who always kept her dress clean and neat and minded her manners. Mary had lovely golden curls and her candy heart had a poem on it. Mary looked very good and sweet, unrumpled and clean sitting on the board beside Laura. Laura did not think it was fair, but it had been a wonderful day the most wonderful day in her whole life. She thought about the beautiful lake and the town she had seen and the big store full of so many things. She held the pebbles carefully in her lap and her candy heart wrapped carefully in her handkerchief until she got home and could put it away to keep always. It was too pretty to eat. The wagon jolted along on the homeward road through the big woods. The sun set and the woods grew darker, but before the last of the twilight was gone, the moon rose and they were safe because Pa had his gun. The soft moonlight came down 
through the treetops and made patches of light and shade on the road ahead. The horse's hoofs made it a cheerful clippity-clop. Laura and Mary did not say anything because they were very tired, and Ma sat silently holding Barry, baby Carrie, sleeping in her arms, but Pa sang carefully, so, and Pa sang softly. Mid pleasures and palaces, though we, may, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Okay, look, chapter 10, summertime. Now it was summertime and people went visiting. Sometimes Uncle Henry or Uncle George or Grandpa came riding out of the big woods to see Pa. Ma would come to the door and house, ask how all the folks were, and she would say, Pa, um, Charles is in the clearing. Then she would cook more dinner than usual, and dinner time would be longer. Pa and Ma and the visitor would sit talking a little while before they went back to work. Sometimes Ma let Mary and Laura go across the road and down the hill to see Mrs. Peterson. The Petersons had just moved in. Their house was new and always very neat because Mrs. Peterson had no little girls to muss it up. She was a Swede and she let Laura and Mary look at the pretty things she had brought from Sweden, laces and colored embroideries and china. Mrs. Peterson talked Swedish to them and they talked English to her and they understood each other perfectly. She always gave them each a cookie when they left and they nibbled the cookies very slowly while they walked home. Laura nibbled away exactly half of hers and Mary nibbled exactly half of hers and the other halves they saved for baby Carrie. Then when they got home, Carrie had two half cookies and that was a whole cookie. This wasn't right. All they wanted to do was to divide the cookies fairly with Carrie. Still, if Mary saved half her cookie while Laura ate the whole of hers, or if Laura saved half and Mary ate her whole cookies, that wouldn't be fair either. They didn't know what to do. So each saved half and gave it to baby Carrie. But they always felt that somehow that wasn't quite fair. Sometimes a neighbor sent word that the family was coming to spend the day. Then Ma did extra cleaning and cooking and opened the package of store sugar. And on the day set, a wagon would come driving up to the gate in the morning and there'd be strange children to play with. When Mr. and Mrs. Hooley came, they brought Eva and Clarence with them. Eva was a pretty girl with dark eyes and black curls. She played carefully and kept her dress clean and smooth. Mary liked that, but Laura liked better to play with Clarence. Clarence was red-faced and freckled and always laughing. His clothes were pretty too. He wore a blue suit and but a blue suit buttoned all the way up the front with bright gilt buttons and trimmed with braid, and he had copper-toed shoes. The strips of copper across the toes were so glittering bright that Laura wished she were a boy. Little girls didn't wear copper toes. Laura and Clarence ran and shouted and climbed trees, while Mary and Eva walked nicely together and talked. Ma and Mrs. Hewlett visited and looked at Goody's Lady's Book, which Mrs. Hewlett had brought, and Pa and Mrs. Mr. Hewlett looked at the horses and the crops and smoked their pipes. Once Aunt Lottie came to spend a day. That morning, Laura had to stand still a long time while Ma unwound her hair from the cloth strings and combed it into long curls. Mary was already sitting primly on a chair with her golden, clear, her golden curls shining and her china blue dress fresh and crisp. Laura liked her own red dress, but Ma pulled her hair dreadfully and it was brown instead of golden so that no one noticed it. Everyone noticed and admired Mary's. There, said Ma at last, your hair is curled beautifully and Lottie's coming. Run to meet her, run meet her, both of you, and ask her which she likes best, brown curls or golden curls. Laura and Mary ran out of the door and down the path, for Aunt Lottie was already at the gate. Aunt Lottie was a big girl, much taller than Mary. Her dress was a beautiful pink, and she was swinging a pink sunbonnet by one string. Which do you like best, Aunt Lottie? Mary asked. Brown curls or golden curls? Ma told them to ask that, and Mary was a very good little girl who always did exactly what she was told. Laura waited to hear what Aunt Lottie would say, and she felt miserable. I like both kinds best, Aunt Lottie said, smiling. She took Laura and Mary by the hand, one on, one on either side, and they danced along to the door where Ma stood. The sunshine came streaming through the windows into the house, and everything was so neat and pretty. The table was covered with a red cloth, and the cook stove was polished shining black. Through the bedroom door, Laura could see the trundle bed in its place under the big bed. The pantry door stood wide open, giving the sight and smell of goodies on the shelves. 
and Black Susan came purring down the stairs from the attic where she had been taking a nap. It was all so pleasant and Laura felt so happy and good that no one would have ever thought she could be as naughty as she was that evening. Aunt Lottie had gone and Laura and Mary were tired and cross. They were at the woodpile gathering a pan of chips to kindle the fire in the morning. They always hated to pick up chips, but every day they had to do it. Tonight they hated it more than ever. Laura grabbed the biggest chip and Mary said, I don't care. Aunt Lottie likes my hair best anyway. Golden hair is lots prettier than brown. Laura's throat swelled tight and she could not speak. She knew golden hair was prettier than brown. She couldn't speak, so she reached out quickly and slapped Mary's face. Then she heard Pa say, come here, Laura. She went slowly dragging her feet. Pa was sitting just inside the door. He had seen her slap Mary. You remember, Pa said, I told you girls, you must never strike each other. Laura began, but Mary said, that makes no difference, said Pa. It's what I say that you must mind. Then he took down a strap from the wall and he whipped Laura with the strap. Laura sat on a chair in the corner and sobbed. When she stopped sobbing, she sulked. The only thing in the whole world to be glad about was that Mary had to fill the chip pan all by herself. At last, when it was getting dark, Pa said again, come here, Laura. His voice was kind and when Laura came, he took her on his knee and hugged her close. She sat in the crook of his arm, her head against his shoulder and his long brown whiskers partly covering her eyes and everything was all right again. She told Pa all about it. She asked him, you don't like golden hair better than brown, do you? Pa's blue eyes shone down at her and he said, well, Laura, my hair is brown. She had not thought of that. Pa's hair was brown and his whiskers were brown and she thought brown was a lovely color, but she was glad that Mary had to gather all the chips. In the summer evenings, Pa did not tell stories or play the fiddle. Summer days were long and he was tired after he worked all hard all day in the fields. Look, there's Pa holding Laura. Laura and Mary helped her weed the garden. Oh yeah, Ma was busy too. Laura and Mary helped her weed the garden and they helped her feed the calves and the hens. They gathered the eggs and then they helped make cheese. When the grass was tall and thick in the woods and the cows were giving plenty of milk, that was the time to make cheese. Somebody must kill a calf for cheese could not be made without rennet and rennet is the lining of a young calf's stomach. The calf must be very young so that it had never eaten anything but milk. Laura's, Laura was afraid that Pa must kill one of the little calves in the barn. They were so sweet. One was fawn colored and, the, and one was red and their hair was so soft and their large eyes still wandering. Laura's heart beat fast when Ma talked to Pa about making cheese. Ma, pa would not kill either of his calves because they were heifers and would grow into cows. He went to Grandpa's and Uncle Henry's to talk about the cheese making, and Uncle Henry said he would kill one of his calves. There would be enough rennet for Aunt Polly and Grandma and Ma. So Pa went again to Uncle Henry's and came back with a piece of the little calf's stomach. It would make a piece of soft grayish white leather, all ridged and roughed on one side. When the cows were milked at night, Ma set the milk away in pans. In the morning, she skimmed off the cream to make it into butter later. Then, when the morning's milk had cooled, she mixed it with the skim milk and set it all on the stove to heat. A bit of the rennet tied in a cloth was soaking in warm water. When the milk was heated enough, Ma squeezed every drop of the water from the rennet in the cloth and she poured the water into the milk. She stirred it well and left it in a warm place by the stove. In a little while, it thickened into a smooth, quivering mass. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Look, it's page 187, and there's just a little bit left. Little House in the Big Woods. I like this one. First graders, I'm sending you lots of teacher love. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the books and the stories, and I hope you have a great day today.